ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being present. Um, today we are going to do a very informal talk session, right? Well, who we have with us is uh, Miss Monica Yo Alsabok, right? Monica is started focusing on with a focus on PR and advertising. That was a major strength, right? Of course, as she got higher up the ranks, she became marketing as well, right? Director of sales and marketing. And her area has always been in hotel chains, but her hotel chains have always been the five-star hotel chains, right? Like JW Marriott, Shangri-La, Grand Hyde. Right? Um, she's also done luxury brands like LVMH, right? MJ Benjamin, Vertu, in the old days. I know we don't like to bring up an example because Vertu is like ancient. But it was a very, for some of you who have not heard of it, was a very luxurious handful, right? Uh, linked with Nokia, right? Yeah. So, uh, her focus has always been luxury brands, and she was in branding, marketing, PR, advertising. Okay. So she's the right person to be here, uh, and it'd be great if you could tap on her knowledge. Unfortunately, knowledge only gets transferred if you want it, right? So this is up to you. You can ask questions. We will all ask questions. And it's your opportunity to ask questions. And there are no stupid questions. Okay, but no one's going to laugh at you for asking stupid questions. Because there's no such thing. Uh, when you're in school, this is your chance to be stupid. I always say that. Right? You get away with it. <laughs> so please ask questions. No one's going to laugh at you. Every question gets answered. Okay? So don't feel intimidated. That's one. Two, um, it is a very informal session, as you can see from the setup here. And we're just going to sit and we're going to talk, right? Uh, there's no agenda, there's no framework, there's no content guide. Our three areas of focus, of course, and we don't have to be limited to this, right? Three areas of focus would be, first, your assignment, which was on the uh, 250 packs, right? Mice, isn't it? No, 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 it's on Grand Hyatt. No, no, for, for what about the 250 packs? That's uh, just an article. Yeah, the that I the okay, all right. So the 250 packs, Question is just you directly. Okay, so they don't know about that. Okay, okay but obviously you didn't read the material. You didn't read the material. What's new? Okay, so we are going to talk about that. Uh, we are moving into a new phase as of October 1st, where they will allow events for up to 250 pounds. What we want to know is, what's the impact on PR and advertising, right? Who else is impacted on this? Right? The main question, of course, is going to be about Grand Hyatt. Right? Grand Hyatt is doing their staycation. Now, they're not the only ones, of course. Every hotel is doing it right now. Staycations are becoming a big thing. Uh, and we want, and you've seen that article, right? You've seen what they're doing, what their story is hygiene, sanitation, safety. And so, what's the PR and advertising angle on this? And Monica, having worked at the Grand Hyatt before, is quite familiar with the brand. In fact, she was involved from Hyatt Regency moving over to a Grand Hyatt during that period, right? Uh, there was a lot of rebranding there, right? So uh, for those who don't know, Hyatt Regency is like the one step below the Grand Hyatt. Right? The Regency is usually in the cities. Grand Hyatt is always the highest five-star standard, right? And we moved that in Singapore. Used to be called the Hyatt Regency. Today it's the Grand Hyatt. Okay? All right. So, now I can take a seat. And uh, we will start uh, by just letting um, Monica maybe take five minutes to tell us a little bit about 
your role today. Today, Monica is working for a company called A to A Safaris. And maybe you can just tell us about A to A Safaris and what you do there. Right? Uh, is this here? Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Osdor and uh, Marani and I used to be colleagues quite over. Uh, my first hotel was the Western, uh, where we were all students and just graduated. So we did three opening, uh, we washed uh, toilets, but I did, I don't know about him. Uh, you know, we, we had to, I used to call... <laughs> yes. I used to say I did the vertical marathon at the what's now kind of called the Fairmont backwards. Because we literally came the steps from the 17th floor backwards in a tight skirt that split and then the high heels. So those were the things that you know we were expected as students to wear. Uh, because in the hotels, you know, I think that's why everyone's in a suit. Uh, I've been out of the hotel line for a long time. Uh, so from hospitality I actually moved into uh, PR. Uh, and uh, what I did there was a lot of uh, hotel, airline, aviation uh, accounts, uh, and also government accounts. So I did a lot of things for the museums, uh, things for the arts and lifestyle, uh, aviation and Rolls Royce and uh, Amherst Airlines, Northwest Airlines. So it was quite interesting. So from a hotel perspective, uh, when I went to public relations, um, I didn't even know what PR was in those days. Uh, at my generation, there were no PR degrees. There were no comms degrees. Uh, and PR in Asia in the old days really was about relationship. It wasn't what we know what communications is today. So when someone said to me, oh, you should try PR, I said, been there, done that. Right? I was a guest relations officer, you know, a front office person. Like, why, why do I want to do the same thing again? Um, then, of course, I spoke to, I was at Morali, I actually met the MD of the PR firm, bought him lunch, and to ask him what the hell do you do for the living? After that one and a half hour lunch, I swear, I didn't understand the word he said. From mediation, media relations, press releases, you know, and I mean, I did it in my hotel school, you know, a, a small module of sales and marketing, but until you, you are attached to someone, you have no idea what you do for a living. I mean, the reality of it. You know, and I think what you have in uh, what you're studying now, and when you're an attachment, then it's night and day. You actually enjoy it, and you're actually doing the job. Uh, so from PR, I actually moved back into hotels again, and that's when I met Murali again, second time now, at a hired agency, when he was at FMB and I was the head of uh, marketing and comms. And I was very, very fortunate. Um, I got to do the rebranding of agency to uh, Grand Hyatt, and I actually launched Mezzanine, the current 400 seater restaurant, um, and Bricks. So it was really, really um, revolutionary from an FMB perspective, not only in Singapore, but for Hyatt globally. So, uh, high in Singapore, as Imani knows, it's always been the yardstick of Asia Pacific. Whatever we do in Singapore, everybody else follows. Not only high brands, but hotels across the board. So, you see, like, Traveller, the line, uh, Marina Mandarin, the Echo Marine, everyone suddenly has a high class food court, right? Uh, the only difference is they're not buffet. Everyone does a buffet, but the way Hyatt does it, and we actually, the FME team and I did a two-year research prior to that launch. We went to every um, uh, our Facebook base, and maybe just, I'll give you a bit of background. Because of the, um, this was in the mid-90s, suddenly hotel restaurants were not in trend. We were classy, okay? Suddenly our Facebook base, like Holland Village, Dutston, Dempsey, uh, Tanjung Paga, became the cool thing. Nobody wanted to go to a hotel to have a meal because it was for old people. It's not in trend. So even the business people wanted to go where it was in trend. Um, and so we, we did all this research, OT and all that, and came up with this concept that at the end of the day, if you want someone to keep coming back to your restaurant, not just for special occasions, right? Like you go for birthdays, celebration, wedding anniversary, are you gonna make money? You know, you want someone to keep coming back for business entertainment, you want someone to come back for just to catch up with your girlfriends or your bros or your old classmates. So this is how uh, Mezzanine was actually formed. It's based on healthy food, food for the soul. You could be a meat eater, a Chinese, a Chinaman who wants the fried fish and chili crab for your tourists. You can get it all one, you don't have to think. And the 400 seater. So I was really nervous, I must say. There was no such, I think today there's no 400 seater restaurant in Singapore that I know of. 
from in Las Vegas or somewhere in America, but not here. So at the time, I think went, went to fashion. Uh, I became the director of marketing for Southeast Asia for COP21. I had no clue about the seasons. In Singapore, it's hot and hotter, right? So when I went to my first meeting, we were talking for fall winter season in cruise lines, uh, leather jackets, winter coats. And I think, who the hell is buying these things, right? Uh, and that was, in a way, my real uh, first foray into the luxury fashion business. Uh, and I, I guess being a woman, I learned fast, right? We enjoy all the branded stuff. Yeah. So, right, it wasn't work anymore. I think that's been my blessing. And morally, no I'm very passionate about what I do. Everything I do doesn't feel like work. You know, um, I, uh, that, that's something not many people can see. If the, my philosophy, if you go, if you wake up that morning and, and you don't want to go to work, something is very wrong, you better find some way to make yourself happy. Because you don't want to be at 50 years old and regret and say, I hated my life. And that has always been my philosophy. If I'm not happy with something, I either find a solution, make it work, or change my life. So that's why I moved from uh, operating sales into PR and then industry, you know. And that's not my passion, but uh, things come along. Uh, I got tech hunted for health communications, which was virtue. So I was a uh, director marketing for Asia Pacific this time, got a bigger portfolio in an industry that I didn't even own a handphone in those days. I was such a uh, gadget dinosaur. Today, an average, I have two to three phones. I cannot live without one. Right? And uh, similarly, I mean, uh, of this, I'm of a generation where uh, I was very fortunate. Um, I did not grow up with computers. So I was very fortunate. I always had a PA to type my proposals for me. I still type with two fingers. Uh, but you know, if you don't evolve, you don't stay relevant. I think that applies especially marketing and public relations and being authentic. Right? So I think at the end of the day, it's evolving into that that point. So what I do today, um, from fashion telecommunications, going back to hotels, what I'm doing, I do safaris. So um, my company, A to A Safaris and A to A Journey, is a lucky travel agency, so I get it. And I'm also the uh, director of marketing and business development for Asia. So A to A stands for Asia to Africa. So it's founded by two uh, ex-bankers, Asian men from the Philippines who used to go on safaris and found out that whenever they were there, there were no Asian faces. They were all Westerners. And I, they realized that, hey, maybe that's a, there's a business that we can do. And this was 18 years ago. We started in Hong Kong. Now we have offices in Singapore, Manila, Cape Town, uh, and representatives in Santa Fe, uh, in um, Melbourne, uh, and Africa. And basically, uh, A2A -A safaris, as well as this safaris, people tend to uh, that is Africa. Then we started about eight or nine years ago, eight new journeys. Because a lot of clients are repeat clients. Because you know, Africa is not one country, it's 50. The 50 African, you know, it's a whole continent. And I think in Asia, we don't grow up with uh, history, uh, geography of Africa, well, maybe geography, more agriculture, but not in terms of destination. Um, so we started AQA journeys, which does uh, uh, itineraries, customized itineraries to Latin America and Antarctica. So how cool is that, right? I figured when I applied this job, I wanted to do something different, and boy, uh, I really got uh, to do some of the bucket lists that I never thought I would be doing so soon. So last year, I was sent on a fam trip. Uh, do you all know what fam trips are? Familiarization trips. So when you start a, a new job in a hotel or uh, a travel company, in a hotel, a fam, uh, experience would be, you might go to different departments uh, to familiarize yourself, that's what it is basically. So what I got to do was, I can't sell something that I've never experienced, and I've never been on a safari. So I went on six safaris. I went to uh, Cape Town, Zambia, and Botswana. And half the towns there, I can't even pronounce the names, because some of the X and the Y has got no <laughs> vowels. Uh, and I met the most beautiful we met uh, safari guides. Uh, so what we do is uh, we plan safari and itineraries to these exotic places based on your budget, uh, your passion. Uh, so it's very, very personal and it's not cheap. 
it's really uh, this thing. Uh, I think Murari has been very fortunate. He opens the hive in Johannesburg, but he's been on a safari and he's lived in Africa. I mean, this was one place I wanted to go, but you know, you, you never planned it until now. It's become my passion. Being a city person from Singapore, I'm an urbanite. Okay? I'm terrified of poultry, I'm terrified of birds. Can you imagine going to on a safari where you have the lion right there? You and your jeep. You know, the giraffe is eating in front of you. Uh, the leopard is like just two feet away. And or 22 lions in a pride walking past you and you're filming and all of a sudden the lion looks up at you and your phone, your, your hands outside your jeep and you're thinking, do I drop my phone or do I bring it in? Okay, these are things where you suddenly feel you're very vulnerable. You know, it's one of the most, it's a feeling. In fact, I, I did a, um, in a radio interview with my boss yesterday on 98. Uh, and it's, it's quite funny when people ask, is there seasons for safari? Uh, winter you see a different thing, summer you see a different thing. You know, rainy seasons to do. Also, it's, it's climatic and seasonal. And especially today, with the COVID and the pandemic, social distancing travel is going to be the new norm. Right? The new norm is now we have to talk with a mask on, uh, Zoom and online. So again, that's what I meant by evolving, right? To stay relevant. So that's what I do for now and it's been an exciting year. It's been exactly about a year that I've done this uh, thing and uh, I'm very fortunate to be invited today uh, to help you with your assignments. So in a way, I'm going to treat you like how I would do my marketing executives and my PR girls and boys where you have come up with a proposal, right? So you ask me the questions um, and tell me what you are doing or what you have done. And I can say, okay, that's pretty good. You know, like, like what he says, no stupid question is a stupid question. No uh, idea is a stupid idea, right? I think the only stupidity is that when you don't try, when you don't put it out there. When you put it out there, even if something that doesn't work, you tweak. And in marketing and PR, let's face it, it's not brain surgery, guys. It's called common sense, okay? And common sense, unfortunately, is not very common in most days, right? So uh, from a sales perspective, so a marketing and a PR person or a team is there to support the CEO uh, from a crisis perspective uh, and the sales team. Because the sales people need um, collateral, they need uh, nuggets to sell, right? So, because I came from a sales background, so I could see what the support is. So a lot of uh, people think, oh, PR is redundant. They don't understand why they're entertaining. Uh, why you're sending out all these news, like your self-glorification. But there is a purpose, right? And there's the whole point of engagement. Uh, I think the first assignment was about, what is it? Uh, the main assignment. Yeah. Uh, the highest vacation, yeah. So maybe... Yeah, I can keep doing it. Okay, thank you, Monica, for that introduction. I think you have a very good idea now of her background, what she's done in her in her life. And uh, knowing that background, I think it's your opportunity right now to ask questions that would, that's going on in your mind. All of you are going to begin your careers in hospitality very soon. Um, and I'm sure you're thinking about what you want to do, where you want to go, right? So you can ask those questions as well. Uh, so why don't I start by just throwing the opportunity to you to ask questions. Yo, <laughs> of course it's me. Um, no, no, no. Everybody can hear me. I've got a loud voice. No, it's, it's all about the. the <laughs> okay. I don't know how it works. Yeah, does it work? Um, um, I have questions about what you're doing. I actually have two. That's okay. Uh, I have a question about what you're doing and some and maybe an advice on the future. So I'm interested in PR and marketing and advertising. Uh, coincidentally, in the fashion industry. Um, but yeah, about your company, you talk, mentioned about social distancing. Do you follow the rules of social distancing from that country the people booked it from? Because I know that in Africa, social distancing is not there yet. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Um, so during the safaris, what do you, how do you know what... So if you, have you been on a safari? Yes. You have, right? Yes. So, you know, when I say social distancing travel, again, it's more like a marketing and a brand term. Mm -hmm. If you, because what you do is be spoke. So you're going to be there with your own family and your own friends. It could be two persons, solo. It could be a 
two in a team. Hell, that's your own cluster, and you and the guy. And in the villas and the camps that we use, a lot of them only have about eight to ten villas. And the social distance is already there. So the good thing about uh, the business that I'm in, we don't even need to adjust. We've already been doing social distancing from the, so the, from the time that we fly from Singapore to, say, Johannesburg or to Kenya, and then uh, the guy picks you up, you're in your own car, right? And you're in your own car, you go straight uh, to the, your light aircraft. It's a small aircraft, and it's just you. Uh, you could only sit for 12. So probably the next step would be, they probably would do like six people, but all with masks, like how we are now. I guess there's certain things, uh, like airlines now are more expensive, because you know, many people are traveling, so prices have gone up. In fact, airfares are now like back to the 80s, where before, you know, budget airlines uh, have come up. Yeah, so in terms of what I mean by social distancing travel, um, safaris are basically very exclusive, what we do. I mean, of course, they've got those uh, mass travel agencies that they have bus loads. That's not what we do. But even if those with the bus loads, they probably have to, uh, uh, you know, reduce by half. Um, and I guess even if they have a meal there, you know, only you stick with your own group. You know, you don't mix and, and cross. And on this part, you don't anyway. You know, you get to know people. Probably that's the, some of the restrictions where uh, when you're out there, you're out in the open air, fresh air, blue skies. You know, you don't necessarily have to wear your mask when you're there because you're with your family. You know, like being in a car with your, your boyfriend or your father. You know, you don't need to put a mask on. So it's a lot of common sense based on that too. And your second question is that about. Uh, yeah, so it's about PR and. I hope, um, I, hope I answered. Yeah, actually, it is. So basically, it was just, it's always been some uh, yes. social distancing. Yeah, exactly. No, it's just now you say it. So people are aware. Yeah, because we never, we never used the word social distancing vacation, but yeah. suddenly the last three months, at business time, even like the radio yesterday, I've got a uh, tattler in the Philippines asking me, oh, can we talk about, you know, so I got interviewed on this. So I kept, I coined this whole thing and I said, well, I guess it's a social distancing that you know you see on papers. Mm. So I think that becomes the, what I, they call it social distancing travel, I call it fresh air travel. <laughs> right, because we're cooped in our own homes or our offices or schools and parks are closed, pools are closed. So to me, fresh air is the next luxury. Isn't it? It's like having oxygen, but with sunshine or even just being out in the rain. You can't kind of walk in the park in some places, right, like in, in Victoria. I mean, you know, they, they only allow one hour a day. I know the Philippines is a, is a curfew, and if you don't go home by 10 o'clock or 8 o'clock something, you get jailed. I mean, so we are really, really fortunate. Anywhere I want to be on a social distancing or on a lockdown in Singapore, at least we are safe, right? But yet, we are not trapped. We're, we're not like, you know, you just have to use your common sense, go for essentials, and don't go out partying and have 20 people in a hot pot <laughs> uh, uh, indoor. I mean, that's irresponsible. And your second question? Uh, yeah, second question is, so as I mentioned, I'm trying to get into PR and... Uh, in fashion. Yeah, so... And you're looking for hotel for... No, I actually so I've got a position that I really like, and well, I'm, so I'm preparing my CV and stuff like this. What would be some of the words or sentences or maybe experience that you would look for in a candidate so I could oh, either work towards that or put them in? Well, you know, um, I think different strokes are different for um, in a CV, I think you have to be authentic, right? And of course, yeah, you, you, you tweak and you adapt some uh, fashion words. But I think at the end of the day, for me, uh, personally, it's about experience and it's about attitude. So when I hire a team, um, the thing I look for, of course, is the passion, because that comes with you. If you're someone with no drive, no passion, no, no matter what project I give you, nothing's going to work. Or it'll be, it'll be fine, but it'll be mediocre. And that's something I'm not. Mediocrity mm -hmm. to me is not acceptable. It's got to be done uh, the best with ability, you know, uh, and something that is outstanding, right? So um, I think for anyone who wants to go to any industry, I think you need to find uh, work there, whether it's an attachment, even as a salesperson, you know, at least you know uh, from the ground what it is. You know, so trying to get attachments, um, you know, I guess it's like uh, hospitality. Uh, in fashion houses, you know, and it's tough work. I mean, it, it's, in fact, fashion is a lot harder than a hotel. It looks glamorous from the outside, trust me, 
uh, it's not glamorous. Hotels have got, uh, what do you call it, procedures, SOPs, and departments to do things. In fact, hotels are more, like, we always say, it's very glamorous on the outside, but what we do at the back is, you know, we are polishing silver, we are, you know, uh, doing all the dirty work, right? And we don't get the best views. The hotel staff usually gets at the basement, you call it the dungeon, in almost every hotel, right? You know, food is, in the canteen is not as great as what we serve. You know, but of course there are some places that uh, we've been very fortunate, like the Hyatt and the Westin. The cafeteria food is actually, you know, on point. You know, it's a pride of the, the, the company and the chefs that you have. But I think to answer your answer in terms of how does someone spot you, I guess fashion is all about creativity, right? So if you send something flowery and fashionable to a hotel, unless it's like a Bulgari hotel or a, a funky JW, uh, a flip stock thing, you probably get thrown away because the person that they hire there, unless that person is someone like me who's looking for a creative person, that would work. So you need to adjust based on that. You know, so like, if, like uh, I'll give you an example. So like, if my personal CV, if I had to say, uh, I've launched Air Asia, right? Uh, when you did the open skies policy, KL to Singapore. Uh, I've done Emirates Airlines, okay, and then hotels. I've done everything from the Fullerton, the Shangri La. Um, uh, even the M Hotel, okay? If I were to apply for a five-star hotel, things like Air Asia and M Hotel, I'll drop because it's the wrong positioning. So again, it's the, the, the kind of brands you want to be associated with. So if I was applying for a job in uh, Louis Vuitton or, or Bounty, you know, I would use more of the, the brands like Bulgari, Giorgio Armani, Paul Smith, you know, to show that I understand your brand. So if it's a mass brand that you're going for, use more mass brand. I mean, that's probably just your basic uh, portfolio. So to me, it's all about experience. And when, when that's the first part of the draw, right? The second part is when I do the interview. Come prepared. Read up about the company. You know, know who the person you're seeing. And now with social media, you can actually stop the person, right? I mean, my time, you have to call people and ask, do you know this person? Can you introduce me to that person? Can you tell me more about that? But now, you can actually stop them on your social media pages and LinkedIn pages. You know, articles if they are very senior people, you know, so, and sometimes, don't assume, in fact, I had this one, um, uh, I used to run my own company, a uh, marketing and PR boutique firm called Communications DNA, and this young lady was recommended to me from a journalist, uh, the editor of Elle magazine, because I was looking for an executive, and she said, I'm going to send you this girl, a CV, and she's really good, she writes very well, came from the University of Sydney, uh, but she's an editorial coordinator, she wants to go to the next step. They sure sent it to me. And when the girl came to, to, the, to my office and interview, she wore this low-cut uh, DFB dress. So the boys, if you don't know, is a fashion designer called Diane von Willenberg. It was a red dress. You all know what a red dress is, right? It just wraps around. Nobody knows. <laughs> yeah. So it was a very low-cut. She showed her cleavage, and you know she and I just looked at her. I just said, "Why are you dressed like this?" And she said, "This is the interview." And she said, "Oh, um, I thought you would like this because you're in fashion." You know, I said, "Yeah, but first impression counts. I don't want a bluesy in my office, and, and and that's not the way I I win business. So first impressions do count. When you're younger, you got to dress a bit older, and when you're my age." It's okay, I can come in jeans and no one's going to question. Right? So again, um, perception is reality. That is one of the best advice I ever got from a boss. So whether it's your dress sense, whether it's what you see in your CV or what you, uh, your impression you give, that is one of the key things. And I think people make judgment within the first few seconds when you walk in. Whether you slouch, your hair is messy, your, so you need to know the brand. And fashion is all about image. So if you are going to say a Club 21 um, or a, a Bounty for Louis Vuitton, make sure you dress the kind of brands that they are selling. So likewise in a hotel, if you're, I mean, everybody is in a suit, you know, so make sure that if you're going for an interview, at least wear a, you know, a, a shirt and tie. I mean, Singapore suits are not as um, common unless you're working, right? But wouldn't it be nice if I saw a young man or woman who came really smartly dressed versus someone who just came like she went to a shopping center? 
the game first impression. It's like when you walk into the higher entrance, the person who opens the door for you is in a nice uniform, but he does have dandruff on his head, you know his hair is nicely groomed. That's why we are grooming folks in hotels, because if I saw a waiter serving me with bad nails and all that, I'd be like, oh my god, I'm not going to eat that. So there's a reason behind some of these uh, SOPs. I hope I answered your question. Yes, so does anybody want to have a question? <coughs> just following up on what Chelsea said just now, um, I guess a lot of these uh, aspiring hoteliers or aspiring career seekers. Uh, is it important to look at your target and be the person that you need to be to move to that target or should you be yourself and then let that discovery move forward? You know, what would you advise kids to do these days? Do you all get my question? Yeah. Right? Because I know a lot of you are like confused, right? You're not sure. You know that you have to be something to get to be director of marketing. But you find yourself not that person, but you still want to be there. And you're trying to change yourself, right? And that's okay. That's good because you evolve that way. But then how do you come to this, this balance? That's a really, really good question, Marani. In fact, um, it actually has happened to me personally, or uh, the way I am today. Um, you all know, heard this proper of saying, what, uh, imitation is the best flattery, right? That's all flattery. Uh, in some ways, uh, it's really spot on. So when I first started, um, you know, in my early 20s at the Hotel of Western, uh, I mean, I'm a tomboy at heart. I still am. I don't wear dresses. I only wear pants. So um, I have very short hair, you know, really, anybody goes with a very short hair, yeah, no. Mine was pretty short, I, if Morali remembers me, my hair was isometric, I had like crop, because I was just, I was always swimming or uh, running and I was just too lazy, you know, um, to tie my hair in school. And in hotels, grooming is one of those very important things. It's always been in a Catholic school or a Christian school, hotels are the same. If your hair touches your shoulder length if you're in operations, especially if you're climbing up, you've got to have a, a you have to tie your hair in a ponytail or a bun, like Singapore Airlines, right? The shipping on. And if you have longer, you have to plait your hair and stuff. So I'm not a money person. I don't have time to do my hair in that way when you're you know, in the front office kind of thing. So I always had my hair short. And then as I moved into uh, sales, I started uh, realizing all my colleagues were former Singapore Airlines girls. But they were older than I was. Very, very pretty, you know, your, your traditional girl next door, look, red lipstick, red nails and all that. And I was always a bit of a funky dresser, you know, uh, I had platinum, a uh, dyed, you know, blue, green, whatever. So of course, when you're in a front office role or a concept role, you're not allowed to do that. So I had to go back to basic brown. So when I went to sales, oh, I thought, okay, sales people are a bit more senior, right? You could do, so I did, instead of the blues and greens, I did the platinum you know, uh, the bond streaks, which is okay. And that was also part of my swimming, because, you know, your head just gets lighter. And then every time I saw someone getting promoted or uh, getting a credit for something that really, it was something we all do, but this one person or that one particular girl, you know, I'm talking from a, a female perspective, right, that really, like, oh, okay, uh, what the hell does she have that I don't? I started questioning myself after the first year because it was like, like what she does is what everyone. How come she's getting the praise? You know, when you start questioning yourself, you're thinking, but I'm getting the sales. Like, yeah, I get an agreement, but why is this person always getting promoted or things, right? So I actually started studying them. Okay, then I realized what is it that they have I don't. Yeah, they have long hair. I don't have long hair. They wear skirts. I don't wear skirts. Um, you know, they have got makeup on, you know, like really pretty makeup, you know, pre uh, precision. Something I went like, hmm, I'm going to do an experiment. I was 21 at that time, or 22. I went to a hairdresser, I actually called a girlfriend who was working in a fashion house. I said, who's the in person now in Ojibwe? And um, it was Casey. Uh, he's like the equivalent of a David Gunn. 
in Singapore to do it. A celebrity like a Tim Robinson type thing. So I went to him, and he was expensive. I mean, for someone who was earning that amount of money to pay for that kind of price, I told myself I'm going to invest in it. So I said, I need to blow my hair to a ball. And he looked at my hair and he said, you know your hair is very short, right? And I said, yup, I want to go to a ball. And it's okay, my hair is very, flows very fast. And it does. He said, okay, which means you have the in-between stage, and I think the girls will understand this, where it grows past the years, and suddenly he has past but funny things sticking out, like he has cut his hair every two weeks, so he does his own hair now, right? So you have to gel it, you've got to slick it back, and just make it presentable still, right? Within six months, I had almost a bob. Within a year, my hair was shoulder length. Um, and then, because of budget again, I went to Kuala Lumpur. Because there was this young designer that opened at Raffle City, um, who made wonderful suits. But I figured if I go to KL, I get it half price. Right? Bring it. So I made suits. Nice double-breasted suits, single-breasted suits, tail skirts and hair but sharp suits. Because in Singapore in the old days, I couldn't afford the designers. We could afford one, but you can't afford the whole bottle. Right? Not like you've got the Zara's and Mangos today where it looks cheap, but it's following a Gucci design, but at H&M prices. My time, you didn't have that. You either have high-end designers or cheap local stuff that badly cut. So I invested in, I think, a dozen suits. Started changing my image, starting watching people, and you know, I didn't have YouTube makeup uh, tutorials. So you just go to uh, Tangs or Robinsons and you look at the makeup artists, and you know, I guess I was an art student, so drawing was an easy thing. So I just practiced myself. The longer my hair grew, the faster I could promote it. I'm serious, you know? Uh, and because of the image, suddenly I was noticed. Because I dressed sharp, I looked good. Not I didn't, but I didn't look the conventional person that they expected. I was funky, you know? I was just funkier than most, you know? Um, it's just one of those things like I would not wear court shoes, I would wear shoes to sling back, you know, instead of wearing new colour uh, uh, stockings, I would wear opaque type because it was fashionable. So, uh, Singapore or Asia and hoteliers are very conservative. Most companies are. So until you can find a mentor, you know, perception is reality. So, they perceive you as uh, a party person. You are drinking all the time. And if your supervisor or your management is very conservative, they will think of can you, can you rely on him or her? Right? So now the social media guys is even more dangerous. Because what you post reflects you. HR people stop Facebook to see what you have been up to. So if you go on an MC and then hear your body in body, people will know. So don't be stupid. I mean, it has happened to one of my staff. And uh, she was one of my better staff, but she ran out of leave. So she took uh, MC, medical leave, on a long weekend. I still remember the poverty or something. And everyone said, I think she's gone, gone to Bali. And I said, yeah, I know. She basically did, came back with a tan, even though she was sick on a Thursday, came back on Monday with a tan. And she said, oh, I went to Bali because I felt better the next day. But when we tried to reach her on a Thursday because we were renovating the office, she had all her personal stuff at her desk. I, and I have a policy, I don't want to touch someone's stuff without your permission, even though I was the boss, it was my business, my company. I told my PA, please call her, just let her know if this is what we're doing. We are clearing off the table because we are renovating that, that weekend, that part of it. Unfortunately, the architect who was renovating my, my office was in Bali and met her in Kudita. And then sent us a selfie of the two of them. <laughs> so we were like laughing, we were like, oh well, I guess the cat's out of the bag. And she was posting on Facebook, you know, uh, and, and swimming and all that. So when she came back, she was terrified. She was so terrified that she was going to get fired. Guess what? Uh, I did a reverse psychology on her. She knew she, she screwed up basically. She knew she screwed up big time. But she's a good star, right? And I always tell, uh, and I'm going to tell you this, whatever I do, or whatever you do with a, a boss like me, please don't do that with any other person. There's not many people are that understanding and that open-minded. I didn't, I didn't even call her to reprimand her. I didn't even question her. In fact, six months later, I promoted her. So she was a very good person. I, I handled uh, a lot of alcohol fines. Don't pay me on Belvedere. 
uh, Hennessy uh, Baldi Bay wines. Okay, so this is for a new Hennessy Diageo, which means Valentine's Day, New Year's Eve, we are all working till past midnight when we are hosting the media. So the, these are some things that I have to take into consideration. They have no life. You know, love life, boyfriend, all those things. I said, they come. Because you're not even going to see any of your friends as long as it fits the profile. So I'm one of those understanding bosses that know that life, uh, you know, there must be a balance in life, but I want you to be able to work hard and I'll reward you. So during the uh, promotion process while doing her, her, her evaluation, I said, is there anything you want to ask me? You know, uh, management style, anything you're not happy with the company, anything you want to see for improvement? And she was so happy with the promotion and the pay increase. She said, oh, actually, I'm very happy here. And she said, but there's been one thing I've been nagging me the last few months, I would like to ask you. You know I went to Bali that weekend, and every time you thought my name to your office, my heart just sank, or was coming out of my mouth, because she was in such a panic that she was going to get reprimanded. I said, and you never brought it up? Then I smiled and I said to her, I said, it wasn't it always punishment, the fact that I didn't want to reprimand you? You're an adult, you're not my child. Right? You come with an attitude. I think this is a lesson you will never forget the rest of your life. I said, and I rewarded you because you always work very hard, you know, and you, I think because of the guilt, she worked even harder, you know, and, and clients were very happy with us. So, I mean, that was just my effort, and I didn't do it intentionally. I just felt that, you know what, you screwed up, you know you screwed up. You know you lied to, to your boss, because after a while, a lie becomes another lie, right? So, I think it's very important to make sure that you find a good mentor, in every job that you're with, that you have somebody who's able to guide you. Um, I think that's one of the, the, the stories of successes. But be the image that you want. So I always tell my team, you want to be a manager, act like one, dress like one. Because by the time your, your attitude is not right, and then that's why sometimes when you say, how come that person got promoted and not me? It's because that, that person is always leading, uh, initiating, not uh, supercharging the colleagues, a team player, and it's always giving ideas. That's what you want in a leader, right? The, the person that's leading your team, your manager. So if you're a young executive, you need to support your supervisors and also initiate your own leadership. My theory when I'm a, I'm a really good number two, make my boss look good. How easy is that? It's not difficult. If you make yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you got to fan the guy. Yeah, yeah but, but be genuine about it because everyone knows who's an assessor. So, you know, you, if you're diligent, you work hard, you know, and you, you reflect the image that you want to report to. Aren't you going to be one of the likely choices? Unless the person finds you a threat, and that's a different story for another day. <laughs> I hope I answered. Sure. Any other questions, guys? Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm the annoying one. No, <laughs> we're, we're Asians. Uh, you know, a lot of us don't. Oh, go for it, yeah. <laughs> okay, Jessica. Okay, uh, so actually, I just want to ask, like, how important is it to have a good relationship with your colleague, other than the other government sectors? Good question, actually. I am very envious of people who actually know what you want to do. I was telling uh, your teachers here that I was an accidental hotelier, literally. Um, I was actually supposed to go into what is known as La Salle. I was the first batch. Uh, I was supposed to do graphic arts and I was supposed to be in interior design. So I always loved art uh, my whole life. And that year they had this uh, first graphic uh, design uh, diploma or something. So I got in. Um, and then someone showed me a scholarship for the, the Westin and said, hey, it's from Ipoh de Lausanne. The teachers are all flying in here, they're setting up this new thing, and DBS is paying for it, and you get a three-year contract with them, and they're paying you uh, a pocket money during the school. So I thought, hey, and in those days, right now, jobs are not easy, you know. Uh, it, it was hard to get a job. So I, and my mom said, at least you got a secure job for three years. 
so you can decide what you want to do. So that's how I got into it. So being um, almost like a management training, you are put in all the attachments you got to put in F&B, um, uh, in a front office, housekeeping, sales and marketing, banking, right, room service, right, you, you go by attachments. And nothing for me was really, the only one I actually really liked was cooking. Because that, that's my personal passion. So the first job, when we graduated, we were all asked which department you want. You had so many interviews with the department head. I went to the chef of the rifle and he threw me out of the kitchen. He said, get out of my kitchen and stop disrupting it. And I said, why? I want to be the first pastry, female pastry chef in Singapore. Because he knows it was a man's job. And the reason why I chose pastry was egg fun. Okay? So that's all. <laughs> like I said, I was 19 years old. So, you know, I was thinking, you know, my hair, I don't really want to get all the smoke and all that, right? And I thought, and I'm, I'm not a baker. I'm too... I wanted to challenge myself, so I picked pastry because pastry is very process oriented, right? And I'm, you know, quite a uh, uh, thing out of the box. So I thought, okay, maybe this is one way to learn something that I'm not good at, right? I mean, why good, you know, why try something that you already know? I'm going to start with pain, I guess, right? But he threw me out. <laughs> and then I said, okay, I want to do back of the house. I was not very comfortable doing front of the house jobs. You know, I could be very, I'm very uh, sociable. But I think sometimes, you know, work-wise, you don't want to be the ones that like have to deal with the guests directly because I find it scary. And it was my first job, right? So you're young, so you're a bit overwhelmed. Some people just have that young bonus. I guess I wasn't. So I asked for training. Went to the training director, and the guy said to me, Can you speak Mandarin? Can you speak Hokkien? He said, if I can speak Malay, then they look, they said, you know, I need someone who can speak dialects. Because in Singapore, the housekeepers, this is before pre-China, people coming in, there's a lot of Singaporeans in Malaysia, right? So a lot of them speak dialect. And he said, you're too young. You're too young. They won't respect you. All the aunties and uncles are older, right? And they are, they are they come, there's a bit more young people, right? So you need to be able to connect with them. And the way I look with my funky hair and all that, straight away, out. So by then, I think, it was two or three months of week. Everybody got a, a role. I didn't. And then the HR lady just said, I'm putting you in front of this, okay? Because I, I can't wait for you to decide where you want to go. So I went, I tried. Trust me, it was, it, it was a joke. I mean, you know, we had fun. Uh, I mean, I did my job, right? But I wasn't, I mean, you did it. You know, I was a cashier, I was a receptionist, I was a concierge and all that. But then I said, okay, I'll try sales. But something was just never... Uh, enough for me. I felt bored half the time, you know. It wasn't my passion. And so I started speaking to headhunters at that point, and suddenly everybody looked at me and said, oh, actually, you're very senior where you are. The next role you're going to be is the uh, assistant director of sales, a director of sales for the next three, four years. Why would you want to move at this point in your life, when your career is there? And I said, I'm a really good salesperson. And I know I, I, I've done ops and I've done sales, right? I can do, I can go back and getting yeah, a good salesperson is it's not easy. But I want to try something before I'm 30. And if I don't like it, I can always go back to what I know. Right? And I don't want to regret it. I don't want to regret when I'm 50 years old and said I hated the last 30 years of my life. I hated my job. Because your job it was at least half your life every day. You know, and I, and I saw myself, I did not see myself as GM of a hotel. You know, I, to me, that was not my, my passion. Because I saw how the GMs work. They had to be on Christmas Eve, and you know. Like I said, again, that, that whole, when you're young, you think, nah, that's not what I want, right? So when I went to PR, trust me, within the first three months, that's when I wanted to quit. Because in a PR agency, what you all think we do in marketing and PR, they only see us at the event at the Glam Park. 90% of my job is research and writing and behind a desk. Okay? And I love writing, but with being in an ops role in sales for the last few seven years or eight years, I'm so used to the freedom of walking around, meeting clients. So suddenly, I'm stuck there, maybe one or two hours meeting, when you're taking a, a taxi to a, a client and in your back, but you're working there till midnight, you're behind the desk, how much you eat, uh, uh, lunch at your desk because you had finished up. And like I said, in those days, I didn't have Google. 
we have finished encyclopedias and libraries. Yeah. So life was a lot tougher, you know. Um, but after the third one, suddenly something clicked. I think because I showed my tenacity and my, my passion, uh, clients started asking for me, you know, and then bosses started giving me projects to do, uh, to, to manage. And then that's when my ideas started coming in, because I think they saw the fact that I tried, you know, like uh, I would do my research, look at banners, what do people do. So with you guys, even in a hotel uh, or any job that you want, you may not want to go to PR marketing, but you need to know what, as a GM, or two, I mean, you as the future GM of whichever company, you want to know what does marketing and PR do for you, your image, personal image, and the company's image. So it's important for you to see what the competition is doing and not just what you are doing. You want to be ahead of the curve. You want to be the first to do things. You want to be, and sometimes it may not be a new idea, but you can always adapt and make it yours. So uh, public relations is all about um, getting brand awareness, the good ones, not the bad ones. So bad ones are like the crisis, right? When you have crisis issues, how do you, uh, you know, you can always say, no comment. Well, if you're not going to comment, others will. Because if it's a new story, it's better you take advice, hire an agency, uh, you know, uh, or discuss and come out with counsel, rather than just sweep it under the carpet like an ostrich with a head, the wax are sticking on. Because it's better that you, uh, you know, address and show empathy, depending, depending on the situation. If it was a suicide case or someone died in a hotel, you know, don't just say, oh, uh, our lawyers have said for us not to comment. Like, wow, we're in the service industry and where's the empathy? Right? And I guess now what has evolved now is not just traditional media. Because of social media, you have idiot stars who might post things that are not on their personal thing and not, not changing. So I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was at Fulton uh, two years ago, as I was on my way home at about 11 p.m. Uh, on a weeknight, suddenly I got a call from the duty manager saying, there's a fire in the hotel. I said, what? Where? The Christmas tree, electrical you know, explosion outside the hotel. So which means everyone can see it. You know, you know where the police in the hotel, they've got this Christmas light up. And he showed me a photo. So the taxi driver, he turned back, went back to the hotel, Went back to my room, my office started coming up. I went, I went to the, the, the fire spot and asked them what is you know, uh, going on when they start. So I started writing down, did the report. The security guards were there, the, the, electric, the, the head of engineering were everywhere there, but I needed to do something that was for crisis. So I would come up with a statement whether it's, if the media should call and internal comms. I mean, if somebody asked, like a guest asked the front office or security guard, what did they say? Because the story has to be one, and it cannot be something that's wrong. Um, so that was quite quite an interesting thing. In the end, thank goodness, um, no media call. The fire engine came. It was put off within five minutes. But what happened was that I had managed later on some tenants. You know, Fullerton, one Fullerton, all the restaurants at the Fullerton Heritage, right? They do all for us. They started taking pictures. The guest that was leaving, say the taxi saw it from across the street, took photos and started posting on social media. <laughs> you know, Christmas tree on fire. Right? And it's year, year end, so it's everyone on social media is posting. But that's something beyond our control. The fortunate part it was not such a big story because nobody died. You know, the building wasn't burned down, it was just one tree, electrical thing. Nobody, no, nobody came to us, but guess asked, right? Like what happened? So, oh yeah, there was, it was pouring rain, so somehow something, you know, they were actually setting it up. It wasn't even set up. So it was an electrical issue. Simple. You know, no, no need to hide. There's some things that it's better not to, I mean, it's factual. It's also quite common sense. So, I mean, for me, it was more solving uh, issues, coming up with new ideas. So I guess it, it, how I actually realized that uh, during the agency days, this job was for me, was that I like the fact that I can create uh, ideas to make it better and for awareness. 
you know, and so in marketing PR, you do events, uh, you do a lot of writing, uh, you do a lot of research, uh, you come up with a lot of new proposals and ideas, and that's truly a lot of my passion. I love to write, you know, I love art, I love everything beautiful, aesthetically, you know, uh, I like to go to parties, so I guess I stick with my ideas of what I like when I post, you know, at home or outside into my job. So that's what I mean by, uh, I'm one of those less ones that, you know, my job is my passion. So I don't, I don't ever feel I work a day in my life. Yeah, I think, yeah. Which is, which is a good thing. So I, I wasn't as fortunate uh, to have like, found your niche, you know. So and it's okay, not all of us know what we want to do, right? I mean, like, you might say, I, I always said I wanted to go in fashion, and I finally did. You know, but that came way, way after my job, and I was recommended for the job by Dr. Moore. You know, uh, I was actually doing Formalato, the Italian jewelry, and within a week, I got promoted to be the head of marketing for the whole South of Asia. Don't ask me how, I mean, I think it's pure uh, uh, luck and sheer hard work, but uh, things happen for a reason. But I think in any job that you represent, you're representing not only yourself, you're representing the company. So if people can see that you are uh, of a certain caliber, they want to, they want to be part of their team. They want you to represent them. You know, so masking yourself is very important. And well, I think the majority of us here are Asians. Uh, yes. Our Asian culture is such that we always have to say, actions speak louder than words. Sorry, dears. This is the real world. You don't want to market yourself and sell your own glory without being, you know, uh, overt uh, and a bit insensitive. You need to know that somebody else will. So you can't blame that person for putting in the ritz, as I call it, you know, and masking yourself. So sometimes you need to do the reports. I mean, like I said, there are different ways of masking yourself. It's not about all rah 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 me, right? It could be submitting a good proposal with an idea. It could be submitting a, a, a incident report done more creatively with new ideas. You know? So market yourself is very important in order for you to get to where you want. You know, and, and unfortunately with, with Asian cultures, we, we tend to be a bit, um, I think the word is uh, embarrassed. Because we are growing up, I, I don't know about you guys, but I think a lot of us that grow up, like parents will say, you know, uh, oh, she's very pretty, no la bad It's a superstition thing, I think, from Chinese or something. You know, but it's more an embarrassment, like, yeah, yeah, we know the person is doing really well. But you can tell you're doing well, right? But sometimes it's not always action. So from a job, there's the subtleties of you need to know when to uh, put yourself out there to make yourself notice, you know? But do it um, gracefully, please. You know, nobody wants a smart aleck. Nobody wants a, a, a smart mouth and like, oh, me, 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 always me. It's okay, you know? But sometimes when, if you're the only one speaking, it's okay because the others probably prefer that this one person like you asking, trust me, I always love classmates that would do all our asking for because as Asians, we don't want the attention on ourselves. That's why I want to go back of my house. I don't like to be in front of my house. So I learn it, the way I do it is through the back. And slowly you, you, you gain confidence. You know, I mean, like public speaking is one thing I hate. I, use, I left the PR agency because I was so afraid of presenting. I never had speech and drama. I mean, I was in drama class and all that. But you know, when you're presenting to clients, government officials, your stomach's knotted. So I actually left the agency after five years thinking, I don't want to be like this every time. You know, and then when I actually started my own company, my ex boss actually said to me, Monica, you know, you have to present now. Still, I laugh. I said, don't worry, I'm older now. <laughs> I'm actually quite good at it. And, and I, I, to me, it's like a, every meeting is a presentation. You know, but when you're younger, you know, you don't see things the way uh, you do after the experience. And I think it's confidence. Once you have confidence, you, you know, you, you evolve in that. And then you, you're able to say things, even if it's stupid. Sometimes it's a stupid question, like, oh, can you please tell me who's this person? It's like some, uh, let's say, uh, some of the stuff.
stars, like the BTS, okay? the, the, the K-pop group. Suddenly somebody is talking about it. He said, tell me what BTS is, right? It's okay, because I'm of a different generation. Oh, by the way, it's in my mind, it's dynamite, but it's the So, you know, I mean, I'm one of those that love um, uh, new things. I watch MTV, uh, you know, and so I actually did uh, F1 Rocks with Beyonce, like IT, and even with the Taiwanese singers. And the only reason why I actually did that uh, job PR or Sing for Tourism Board was because I wanted to meet Beyonce. I met every other star except Beyonce. <laughs> yes, but never mind. You know, it was a good one on my portfolio. It was a good fun, right? So sometimes you need to um, have a little bit more flex, you know, uh, and step out of your comfort zone. I think that that pushes you, so you evolve. I think all of us want to do what um, uh, you know we're good at. But after that, when you get to that that point, what's next? Don't you want to challenge yourself? Don't you want to be better? I mean, I think for me, it's about the the competition is not about the my colleague, my own. Comp I have my own competition because you want to better yourself, right? You want to inspire yourself. You don't want to go to a job to do the same thing every day. Even if it's the same thing every day, you can always be creative about it. You know, in 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 logical ways. Our online students still alive? Yes, we are. Okay. Are. Do you guys have any questions you want to ask? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, Ethan, please go ahead. Uh, Ethan, sorry, I didn't hear you. I was just waiting for you to finish your story. Oh! <laughs> Good question. Uh, okay, so what uh, we've been doing, okay, look, during this pandemic, no one's expecting it, right? And travel is really in a dead stop. Surprisingly, in America and Europe, people are still traveling. I've got a lot of bookings from the States, people are already booking to go for end of the year and next year. Even in Singapore and Asia, I've got a lot of inquiries, new inquiries for next year. Uh, a lot of repeat customers are already booking for January or August next year. Uh, because they know that if you wanted to go on a holiday, you want to go where it's beautiful, but there are not many people. You don't want to go to a city. Again, like I said, the social distancing vacation, right? The new norm. So, um, to answer Ethan's question, what um, I have recommended to my bosses is about engagement. Because just we, we shouldn't be selling, right? When in times of uh, 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 like a pandemic, you want to be part. You have to be authentic. These are people who have spent thousands and uh, thousands of dollars the last uh, 18 years with you. What do you what do you do for them next? You should check on them, right? So that's what we did. We did news, newsletters, e-newsletters. So everything is via the electronic way, the webinars. We even offered free virtual tours, uh, safari tours, uh, and like on uh, Zoom, um, you know, where we get a guide with old videos and we will put up something. Um, we even did, uh, just three weeks ago, I did a, a design panel where we showed um, all the beautiful designs of the lodges at the camp. Because people think that you live in a tent. You technically are, but it's, it's more than glamping. It's like a Chris Carlton suite. suite. It's like you go to an Amman resort. The swimming pool, the massage bar. It's literally like having a little mini boutique hotel done in a very cool way in the middle of nowhere. And then you take the drive out. So like, it's like an island within an island. Um, so we, we actually got a panel of about four, uh, three companies and a interior designer to be the moderator. And they started talking about the designs, what the inspiration. So, like one designer would talk about uh, culture or uh, sustainability. So there's different themes, and they're quite they're quite innovative. In Africa, my God, everything is solar, everything is sustainable. I've never seen uh, a more advanced group. Because when I was landing, I remember all I saw was the mirrors. 
I'll show you what that was. Every rooftop was a solar panel. Every rooftop. I mean, Africa, right? I mean, but people think Africa's hot. It's like Australia. There are the four seasons. So I was there in November, which is supposed to be uh, summer, but it was so cool. The temperature's like 90 to 22 degrees, you know, but with the sun, you know? And it was, it was, it was really nice. So we do a lot of, uh, so like um, two, about well, eight weeks ago, I also launched uh, an e-cookbook where we got all our partners from all across Africa, Latin America, and Antarctica to submit a recipe that the chef or the owners uh, personally cook, you know, in the camp. So we came up with this e-book to actually just remind you beautiful places that you visited or places that you might want to visit with simple recipes and cocktails. So like for Brazil, we did a caipirinha, then we did a, a mambo, a South Africa a salad. You know, we had vegetarian, we had meats, uh, we had desserts. So it came out like an old sort of like Indiana Jones, very Harry Potter-ish uh, style, you know, and just flips. And we sent it to uh, our clients, you know, to say something to help you while you're shopping at home. You know, and a lot of them appreciate it because, you know, there were simple uh, recipes that you can just make. Yeah. So, I mean, Ethan, I mean, to answer your question, basically, um, the way we do it for safaris is very bespoke. So you have to be very authentic. At this point in time, it's not about selling. I think it's now about engaging with your, your clients and making sure that they're okay. And it's nice, right? Just to check, hey, how are you doing? It's quite nice how uh, an old classmate or an old friend that they've always supported suddenly calls you up and sends you a basket of fruits or just text you and say, how are you doing? I think all of us are not in a happy place. I mean, it's a new norm. So I think in, in business, you need to know when to pull back. So I just want to be clear that the days and days of time is That's right. That's right. Yeah. So we, we, we don't have a packages like full packages. We basically have to, let's say, if uh, Ethan, if you have plan to go, uh, I, would, I would have to go to you and I say, okay, Ethan, how many people? Is it your, is it three generation? Is it your parents? Was it with you and a plus one? You know, is it, are the children involved? Uh, what's your passion? Uh, are you a um uh, Are you a photographer? You know, so that's where we then we will plan. And some people would have the destination that they want to go, so we will give find the right plan, and then we tell us your budget also, right? Because it's important. It's not cheap. You know, it's it, it's really a journey of a lifetime. Uh, so if you're going to spend that kind of money, uh, you want to make sure that everything's getting paid off. So all the internal flights, the the charter flights. Is taken care of by us because it's not you got to call different people to book, uh, and it's not as easy. It's, don't forget, Africa is a third world country, you know, and it's huge. So you need um, uh, you need a plan, and people plan almost a year ahead. Nobody goes on a safari like on a whim. I mean, there are last minute people, but usually people plan. Uh, we wait for bookings for 2021, 2022 for Antarctica, uh, Latin America, and Africa. Because I also handle um, some bespoke uh, need-to-measure kind of uh, packages, like from fashion all the way to um, shopping experience. Yes. Because I, I came from fashion also. Yeah. Huh? You mentioned yeah. So, yeah. 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 That's right. So like from fashion, you'll be more like a personal shopper, right? You need to know your client's budget, your, um, you know, the client's taste. Unless the client wants to make, do a makeover, then you also do a different kind of looks for them. But sometimes you still need to know how ready your client is. You know, you can from like long heads, top to short. I mean, I think that would be quite a rude awakening for a lot. That's true. <laughs> yeah, and you know, uh, fashion clients uh, are very different from hotel clients. Uh, not as easy, especially when you do the tight guys. Okay, um, we are just about hitting the one hour mark, and I promised Monica I'll let her go within an hour. But just before she goes, I think we just want to end by talking about staycations in Singapore. And many hotels are now embarking on staycation packages. 
um, would you be able to give us some tips on what, if you were part of a hotel right now, what kind of stuff would you do from a PR and advertising perspective to capitalize on the staycation opportunity? Um, well, I mean, what, what do you guys think of vacation? Does it work? Because you can't travel? I mean, let's like, say you've got all the budget in the world, hard luck, and you could stay at the Shangri-La or the Coachella. Would you go? So what would entice you? I will. I'm a staycation. Yeah. So I think staycation, staycation packages actually work in Singapore because we have a lot, lot of vacation. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. So, in fact, staycation was very big even pre-COVID, right? So, why not? And especially for a lot of the expat clients here and uh, people with young families, uh, and they live in a HDB with no pool facilities or uh, private clubs, a staycation is one way to, you know, let off steam and, and in a different environment. A staycation is all about uh, the inspiration, right? So, I mean, the inspiration again, uh, marketing would be, well, definitely social media would be in, but you also, at the end of the day, know your audience. Okay, so if you're a, a hotel that is uh, really luxe and your, your target audience is a lot older, so uh, once you establish who your target audience is, then you find the channels that they uh, would view. So if you're trying to target a 50-year-old person and above, I don't think social media is the way to go, right? Well, maybe Facebook. Right? I mean, uh, uh, you guys are at the age where, you know, probably you're more on IG, right? Or uh, Instagram more than Facebook, right? I mean, Facebook is, uh, I guess it's been around longer, right? Probably Snapchat and all that. So again, uh, you, whatever you market uh, for vacation, it's all about inspiration. So it's got beautiful photos, you know, uh, with a lot of information. And easy. One, one of the crazy things I always get is that when people send me a mailer via WhatsApp, they don't actually give me the, the booking details or something that I can just click into a link. You know, you got to think, people nowadays, once you get an email uh, or a message, it's all about convenience and speed. You lose me if it's too much information uh, or too long. So pictures, like I said, pictures speak a thousand words, right? So a staycation, you know, it doesn't even have to be about the room. It could be about the experience. So I guess for me personally, from a staycation perspective, I would depend on the brand's DNA. Uh, I would go for the the DNA of the thing. So like let's say Shangri-La for instance. Shangri-La, the name Shangri-La is like paradise, right? You would use that to say, you know, get your own, you know, find a, your piece of paradise, let's say. Okay? Because it's all about gardens, it's the Shangri-La, and it's an old movie that's all about going to this paradise. And then show waterfalls or beautiful greenery that most of us have to go to gardens by the bay, or botanical gardens for it, or the reservoirs. So I think um, for travel and, and special vacation, it's about inspiration. Right? And if room is your thing, you know, like you've got a special room with a floating bed or something like that. Then you know uh, you can talk to like uh, you know the sky's your limit or something like uh, come find your own heaven and you have like a floating thing and you know with the digital VI cities you know you can always make things a bit more floaty. So I think again how to market vacation is social media is, is good but knowing your audience is important. So if your price range is a range where a younger audience uh, can afford it. It would be $150 or something. Yeah, social media is definitely the way to go. But I always believe different channels for different audiences. Uh, today's um, marketing and PR is all about integration. There's no one size fits all. It has to be targeted at the right audience. It really has to be uh, sometimes even face to face. So sending a mailer by email is not a bad thing. It's old school. But if it works, why? not use it, right? Because if I can get a WhatsApp immediately, rather you send me an email, it can be both, but let's say I don't check my Gmail. If you're not working, you only check your work mail. Okay, unless you're in school, you've got things to do or you're expecting. But let's say someone who's a busy uh, CEO, 
you always as a PA to check his, his emails or whatever. You really want to get that, that person to uh, buy into your product. If you have his mobile number, isn't it possible to just send him a beautiful photo and say, uh, why don't you spoil your family this weekend? You know, knowing the psyche of a person. So there's a lot of psychology in some ways. You know, knowing what you want. Like, if it's Mother's Day, I don't know what to buy. Suddenly you receive this email or a mailer or you see on a bus stop or a, on a bus app. You know, uh, what if you spoil your mother with a spa and a staycation? And the price is there or something like that. You might, like, ah, solve my problem. But not all of us have that ability to know what your parents want and you want to do something special. And especially with the pandemic, I think it's uh, it's even harder on people's uh, mindset, that their psyche, everyone's, some people go through depression, uh, some people go through angst and you know, uh, some people find the silver lining to be born in their family, but not everyone takes stress being at home as well, right? I'm sure you personally have, have felt it and friends, you know, sometimes by the tirade on their texts, on their messages, you're like, wow, this person is very stressed. You know, when, when they are going on and on about not happy thoughts, but really unhappy thoughts. Yeah. All right, then. Sorry, in terms of um, uh, the different channels, are you all aware of, like, just like social media, that there are other avenues? What's your, I mean, your project, what do you put? Like, traditional media, and new media. Do you all list it now? I guess because a lot of you come from, like, where are you from? Singapore. Is Singapore you? Indonesia. India. India? India, yeah. So, and where are you from? India. India. So, like, in Singapore, we don't have many billboards. Okay? And in India, Malaysia, Indonesia, billboards are big thing. Our billboards here are so expensive. When they got the digital ones at airport, uh, Suntec. On the Google Hotel, right? So uh, you need to look at, right? Light boxes. Yeah, light boxes. But Singapore, uh, from a regulatory board perspective, and also for so they don't get accidents and do a bit more urbanized planning, you know, uh, like see New York Times Square, right? You get the Times Square thing up on the billboard, like the biggest thing you can get, uh, buildings at the banks and stuff like that. So. You can get created, so besides like, even like lamp posts, right? Those banners on Orchard Road, campaigns and stuff like that. Um, in office buildings, those TV channels. Um, and that's also for broadcast, it's radio, right? Radio, uh, YouTube, um, influencers, right? So influencing, uh, influencers, sorry, that was what I was trying to get at. So from a staycation perspective, using influencers are a very good thing because they, they walk you through the experience. Beautiful photos, doing acrobatic poses and stuff like that. You know, and, and that's always nice. Right? So I guess you need to stand out because everyone's going to be doing it. So uh, finding the right, uh, the right medium is important. But it's also depending on the country that you are also doing. And your budget. At the end of the day, that's why social media is still the cheapest. Because you, know, you only use your in-house or your agency. You don't have to pay uh, you can pay in terms of boostings or your ads and all that, but it's very minimal, right? On Facebook and IG, and most companies will have accounts, you know, pay a basic budget. It's only like 400 bucks. Well, if they don't have those budgets, then I'd be very worried. <laughs> I mean, for hotel, right? I mean, it's quite scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, if there are no other questions, We'd like to thank Monica very much for having spent her precious time with us. Um, and I know she's a very, very busy woman. So right now they're very busy with the a to a safaris, getting ready for the rebound, right? When things change. So all the best to you in your uh, future as well, Monica. Thank you very much. Monica is, by the way, part of our industry advisory board. So we'll definitely be inviting her again sometime in the future. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.